Major funding for these programs is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, Capital One Bank, Geneva Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, The Wickoff Group, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of American Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, Colliers International New York City, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG Partners, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, Bargolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, Popular Community Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJB Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and These Friends. So the kid from Boston who becomes, who goes to Colgate, then changes his career because it's an interesting life during Colgate, becomes the, uh, the CEO at Massey Knackle because he won the coin tip. So today I'm very lucky to have my friend Paul Massey over here on my show, Building New York. So tell me a little bit about your grandparents and your great-grandparents. My grandparents on my mom's side were, or uh, well, their parents were from Ireland, County Cork, yeah. And how they come over to uh, Massachusetts? I'm not sure. I, uh, my grandfather uh, was cutting meat in Faneuil Hall um, as he put himself through law school. At uh, he was a butcher at Faneuil mm -hmm. Hall, mm -hmm. and he then went to law school. Mm -hmm. And what about your father's side? Dad's mom was uh, Canadian um, Indian. My grandfather was um, a guy from Lowell, Mass. So how did your parents meet? They met at, uh, at the, uh, the, the south shore of Boston was the, uh, the Irish Riviera. So the met, Irish Riviera? They met at a dance hall in, uh, in Situate, Mass. Now, at that time, your grandfather was a lawyer. He no longer was uh, cutting meat. Right. And on that side, and the yep. grandfather on the other side? My other grandfather uh, owned our town newspaper in Dedham, Mass. Now, your father and your mother meet, and your father goes into the, the newspaper business, right? Yep. My, my granddad on the newspaper side had each of the kids work at, the, uh, at the, the plant. Now, the interesting thing is that you had mentioned to me that your dad worked the line of type machine in the evenings, right? Yep. So 14 years working at night. We used to watch uh, Batman and uh, um, all those daytime TV shows with him when we came home from school. Because the paper would come out in the morning. Right. So he they worked through the night on the linotype machines, which are the, the where they set the type with uh, letter by letter. Now you had mentioned to me that your grandfather had sold the business. Your grandfather sold the business in uh, in the in the nineteen seventies. And your father was a little upset, and he yeah, yeah. he then went he, to work. I think he would have liked to have bought the paper, but he worked for uh, five different media companies. It was at that point it was the eighties and. Uh, it was a small media chip. And, um, and then he and your mother ended up in Alaska. How, tell me about that. Yeah, my dad met the sixth owner of this newspaper chain, and uh, you know the chemistry wasn't there. So um, one of the prior owners of my grandfather's paper called him up and said, uh, I'm buying a paper in Fairbanks, Alaska. And you, but that was far from Boston. I mean, from you know, th th a different uh, neighborhood. We were, we were very local. We were very local. So I had gone away to college at this point. We're going to get back to your, your, your childhood before you went to college. Yeah, yeah. So my dad um, 
told them, forget it, I'm not moving to Alaska. And so this was the early 90s, a year went by, my dad's still not employed, and the phone rings again, it's the same a guy named Dean Singleton, he owned Media News Group, a Denver Post, it was a bigger company. And he said, it took me forever to close in this Alaska paper, and you know, why don't you go up there for a couple of years, and uh, then you can move somewhere in the lower states. So. Ten years later, they retired from Alaska. They had a fantastic time. It was interesting. So tell me about you, you growing up, brothers, sisters? I'm the oldest of four, four and four years. Um, two sisters and a younger brother. Now, where are you growing up? Which town? Dedham, Mass. It's one town south of Boston. Now, you had mentioned to me that you originally started in public school, correct? Yeah. One. And, and then what happened? Uh, the sixth grade, you were a uh, rambunctious uh, mm. student or what? Maybe was a little it? bit. The, uh, the sixth grade teacher called my mother in and said that uh, if I went to the local public high school, it could go one way or the other. But uh, she had the answer for her. So how do you go to this, one of the oldest schools in the, in the country, right? Tell me about it. The your... oldest school in the country, Roxbury Latin. It's 369 uh, years old today, older than Harvard. And uh, it was fantastic. It was, the beauty of it was, it, and still is, that it's a melting pot school. It throws a couple of kids from each Boston town into a, a small class. My, there were 39 kids in my graduate now you, class. Now, did you live there, or did you no, come home at night? No, it was a day school. Day school. So how far was it from? Five miles from home. Oh, It was no in West Roxbury, which is the, one of the southern parts of Boston, one of the communities. So you only had 39 kids. So tell me about I was, was number it? 38, by the way, graduating. Yeah, well that, that we, we, we figured out because of some interesting <laughs> time. So you're over there, 39 kids. Mm. I mean, that was the, nearly the size of my class when I went to public school in New York City. Yeah. So it, how many kids were in your class? I mean... It, it, you'd well, have 10 to 15, you know. It was, um, the fabulous thing about it is everyone had to do everything. So I was, I was, I played sports, but I was also in the glee club, and I was thrown into a lot of stuff I never would have done. It was fantastic. Now, was it difficult to get into this place? I mean, back then it was probably not going through its heyday. Now it's incredibly difficult to get in. So you, you told me about some jobs. You worked at Woolworth. I mean, people wouldn't even know what Woolworth was. You know, yeah. Woolworth was the the predecessor to uh, <laughs> you know to Kmart, which is also in a, a, in a difficult thing. But tell me about some of the the odd jobs that you worked at when you went to. Uh, yeah, that was the first one. I, I got myself a job washing dishes at the luncheon counter at uh, Woolworth, and came home and told my parents they were horrified. Um, had some fun summer jobs through the years. Now you worked uh, also in the clothing. Yep, sold jeans in a in a dungaree store. They used to, you know, um, worked construction for a local contractor. Uh, waited on tables. Um. So now you you know you're at this premier private school, and you told me that out of the 39 kids, it was normally standard that you went to Harvard or Yale <laughs> or Princeton. What happened? Now, you were 38, but yeah. you were now how do you end up, you know, <laughs> since you were isolated? I mean, you, you had only been to New York City once or twice in your life. How did you end up uh, going uh, to a, a college not too far from Syracuse University? I mean, you had played football, you told me. but Yeah, no, they had uh, D1 wrestling, and uh, I wasn't recruited there, but I didn't know how, what the Did you know anything about Colgate? Um, I just went up there, I did a East Coast college tour, ended up there on a sunny day, and uh, it was 75 and sunny, the kids were running around with their Frisbees. I, the furthest west I'd ever been in my life before I showed up at Colgate was Springfield, Mass. We were really local. And um, so I didn't really know what it was, it just looked fun, it had my favorite sport, which is wrestling, and um, I ended up, I was able to walk on and make the team. And, now, now, you told me, which probably people wouldn't realize, that you had a very interesting year and a half, uh, truly a year and a half, right? Maybe, was it a little longer? Or? Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I, I had a blast at Colgate, and I did... Um, President of fraternity? Yeah, re wrestling team, rugby team, manager of the school business, um, uh, school newspaper, business manager. So I was doing everything um, but study. So, so what happens? You get a, uh, I get a, I get a, you, get a fo you get a phone call from the dean. I what did. Was it? I did. Ha halfway through my junior year, I, I came back and looked in my mailbox, and there was a little note from him: "Come see me. You're 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 out of here." 
for a, and you can reapply for your position at the school. So now, how old are you? 19, oh no, 20, maybe 20. So you're 20, you have two and a half years in, but the, really the last year was worthless because you had to take up courses later on. Yeah. And you, then you decide to hitchhike uh, to California? Yeah, no, I called my dad up. I said, uh, you're never going to want to see me again, um, so I'm going to California. I, I got kicked out of school, and he said, I should have told you, so did I. Get home, I'll get your job in town in Boston. But he let you hitchhike first, right? No, I, 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 I hitched a ride home, yeah. Okay, no, 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 no. but didn't you Did go I go? No. No, okay. No, no. But he, he got you a job very interesting. Um, at the bank, right? Yeah, at a bank called Union Warren Savings Bank. It was an old bank on Federal Street in Boston where I uh, helped um, little old ladies balance their checkbook in the at, at least you had the capability to know what a checkbook uh, was <laughs> and, and, and able to uh, reconcile a check. Yeah. So now, how long was that, uh, that, that training, that good education for you? Yeah, so I, I was there about six months and uh, I... Uh, I decided I didn't need school. I want to be the president of the bank. And my strategy was I'm going to be in before, you know, was, there were probably 200 people working in this building. I was going to be the first one in every day and the last one to leave. And I, I did that. And then um, six months in, I realized uh, it wasn't going to be so fast for me to be the president of the bank. So I started chasing that dean to try and get back into Colgate. So as we would proverbially say, you begged? begged. I had friends write letters. I had the president of the bank who I used to want to be write letters. And so what happened? So how long were you out between uh, the junior years? So it was like January till uh, through that summer, through that summer. So w the August of what would have been the start of my senior year, I'm sitting at my clerk desk at the bank and the phone rings and it's, uh, it's the dean. And he said, you know, I'm, I've thrown up, I've ignored you so much and I've, um, I've gotten all your letters from your friends, and this is usually a big mistake, but I think I'm going to let you back in early. So I was allowed to return to school. You know, it sounds to me, you know, like somebody in work study at the prison saying, you know, <laughs> we, we, we should let you back, but I, I'm not sure, but we're going to give you that last chance. That's, that, that was the conversation. Show up at my office and don't mess this up. What year is this now? So see, this is 1981. And, um, so did you have to repeat your junior year? I had to do, the net of it was I did one extra super senior year semester, which was, I was utterly miserable. But you also told me that for a student who, uh, since I wasn't the best myself, I have to tell the truth, you know, <laughs> over there. Um, you, as, a, as opposed to being below 2.0, you went to like a 4.1. Yeah, when I had grown up quite a bit, and um, I used the, the work habits that I developed at the bank um, to, to get a 401 average, the full, only for the last three semesters. Wait a second, but first of all, at this <laughs> time, Grandpa had sold the newspaper. Right. So even if you wanted to yeah. be in the newspaper business, yeah. you didn't have that. Yeah. And, and you learn being in the line of top business at night is a tough career yeah. over there. So you buckle down, you graduate in college, and what do you decide to do? Well, during school, I think the summer of my the last so sophomore year, I had worked at C.B. Richard Ellis, which was then called Coldwell Banker Commercial, for a summer. Keeping records, right? You were yeah. Uh, tabulating records? Data bank, tenant data bank uh, tabulator. In English, what did that mean? Ten it was their tenant tracking system. I would go walk up and down office buildings in Boston and take notes on who, which tenants were where. So, so now, okay, so you graduate, were there jobs in Boston at CBRE? No, well, that was the first thing I did. I went to the Boston boss, and, um, and it was a mature office. They had been open for a while. So I said to him, you know, I have to work here. And he said, I've got one opening. I've got a Xerox President's Club guy, and I've got a uh, IBM Chairman's Club salesman. And, you know, I'm going to pick one of those two. And no offense, you're a nice kid for the summer, but I, uh, I'm not rolling the dice on you. I was devastated devastated. So I called, the, I had run into, through my fraternity, I'd run into a national accounts officer at CB who was um, stationed down in New Jersey, but he, I called him up and I said, they're not hiring me in Boston, and um, I obviously wasn't going to compete with my classmates at Procter & Gamble or some fancy training program with my great grades. So he said, well, that, 
the Boston thing's the bad news. The good, the good news is we, we'd take anybody in New York City, and uh, you're qualified. So. Now, this was interesting because Coldwell Banker, you know, which was the company at that time, really wasn't a, a true commercial. They had really taken over the, the firm of Sutton and Town. Right. And Sutton and Town was really a leasing firm as opposed to an investment sales. They, they weren't a full-service real estate broker over here. Yeah, no, they, they had made an acquisition of a firm they thought would give them local access, and um, it was primarily, that's right, a leasing company. So they were, they were really in, in an early stage. Now, at this time, were they still owned by Sears Roebuck? Yes. Yeah, it was part of the Sears Financial Network, Allstate, Prudential Insurance. Um, um, no, Allstate, um, Prudential Securities, and, and Coldwell Banker. Yeah, look, you could have sold that. You know, you had the experience over here, <laughs> you, you know, from the Woolworth days and the Gene days <laughs> that you could have been over there. So now you, now you end up in New York, and you had never really been here much in your life. No. Where, so where do you end up in New York City? Where, where are you living at this time? I lived in the attic of a cousin's, one of my... Dad had a cousin in Inglewood Cliffs. I lived in their attic and took the bus into Port Authority. Um, I came, when I came to the city, I had 150 bucks in my pocket. My dad really had a hard time with four kids in school all at the same time. So we were, I was on, on my own. So you come here, you're living at the cousin, you're taking the, uh, the bus into the Port Authority, and you're working on Madison Avenue at Coldwell Banker. Mm -hmm. And what do you start doing over there? Tell me about your beginning. So they, they had um, an early version of the wheel program where first I was working in market research, that same tenant tracking thing. I did about six months of that. Then I did a, a rotation around the company. They were, they were developing what they now call the wheel program, which is a you know, rotational training program. So that was great. So what happens? So I did that more or less about a year, and, um, and then I start to get the itch to get into production. But I was watching, they had about 40 leasing people by then, and uh, you know, I, uh, I, I knew I had to figure out a way to differentiate myself. It, right around the same time, Bob Knackle shows up, and we didn't know each other, it was completely coincidental, but he had worked for them for three But summer. he worked for them in New Jersey, New Jersey, I believe, right? because when he was going to Wharton. Right. And he so, was younger than you, a couple, about two years younger than Bob's you. Bob's story is they were sending them all out to get jobs at banks, and he, he walked into a Coldwell banker thinking it was a bank, and uh, it's a true story. How, how'd you cold call to become a, uh, an investment sales broker? I mean, today you guys are one of the most prominent investment sales brokers in New York. Yeah, CB had a great thing, a, t a couple of great things. They had a, a, a very much a territorial approach, meaning geographic focus for whatever your specialty was. Um, so... Th they asked for volunteers for people who would do investment sales. And Bob and I knew their system from their other mature markets, Jersey, Boston. And so we, we were the first two in and we picked territories. We created our own territory from Bob. I worked from 60th to 76th, 5th to Lex. Bob worked Lex to 1st. Now, there were other parts of the city. Were, were you limited yourself? We perceived that was the Gold Coast. We first started out cataloging the entire east side, but it was too big. You couldn't manage it. So we, we ratcheted it down to about 1,000 buildings. And there was a beauty in that. There were about three to 400 million in annualized sales, 30 or 40 trades a year. So it, it was manageable. And we, we, uh, we, it was also the mid-80s at this point, so it was go-to-work, make-money time. And we, we did really well. What was your first deal? Your first, everybody remembers that first sale. Oddly enough, it was a buyer representation assignment. We hadn't really gotten into strictly doing seller representation. Um, so we represented a company called uh, AMI, American Medical International, out of Beverly Hills, and they bought a building on 3rd Avenue and 81st Street. There was a, there was a story there. While it's under contract, it, it burns to the point that it's gutted. So I had to call the real estate director up from AMI and say, you know, hey, by the way, and he said, what, are you going to tell me the building burned down? You sound so nervous. I, I don't care. Did we're they gonna, buy the building We're going to anyway? got it anyway, yeah. <laughs> okay, so at least you had that. Yeah. So what happens? You, you and Bob, you're two young guys. How did you decide that you wanted to go out on your own? You're 28, I think. Bob's 25 at this time. Yeah, he was 26. I was 28. Um, we were de facto managing a group at the end of about 16 people, and they were great, but we went to the uh, president of the company and said, wouldn't it be great if uh, you could give us some real authority and maybe make us a, a small division and lay on, 
whatever. Now, was this the president of Coldwell Banker in the California? Or yeah, yeah. This was the, the main company. Yeah. So we, we made a pitch to him to make us a special deal, and he had 50 offices and 50 top brokers, and he politely ignored us. Hey, he said, look, I, I really didn't, you know, I need New York, but you're the kids. I, we could understand it. We could understand so, it. So what happens? So we left. I know, but so you left over there, and you go into Chemical Bank, and you get a silver dollar, <laughs> a shiny silver dollar. Tell me about the shiny yeah, silver well, dollar. Yeah, what, how do you, what do you name the company, right? So we went and... Yeah, Coldwell Banker was already taken, so you couldn't use that over there. <laughs> no. So um, we went to Chemical Bank, bought the silver dollar, and we went to the Waldorf, to the clock. To the top, clock, right? You know, the, right. You the know, famous in, clock over in there. In the middle of the, uh, the, the, uh, the ground floor. And um, we flipped best out of seven. You had four, it was four to two? I think that's right. It was four to two. And I, I told Bob it was divine intervention because, you know, back then it was the only way to find us was in the phone book and who could spell Knackle? So I think he did us a favor. Wait a second. Knackle was before Massey, if I, <laughs> if I remember my alphabet well. Right. But uh, people have a hard time spelling it. So the benefit was he became chairman and you became CEO? Yeah, so when I won... Okay, because you got the name. Yeah. Okay, you know, it's yep. like the flip over there for the football game. Yeah. Okay, the first uh, possession and then the second possession. Now, your first office was interesting. It was uh, this building that you had a manual op elevator, right? Yeah, 12 East 52. Two rooms, one for the two of us um, and our our admin assistant. And um, Yeah, the, there was a guy riding the elevator with us. It was one of the old buildings. Now, but the recession comes, right? Mm. Uh, the recession comes, and um, at this time you had found, you had met your wife already, you were married? Married in the spring of, of the year we started the company. Started the business in November and got, had gotten married in the spring. Bob was but November of uh, 88, because you're cel uh, exactly. celebrating your 25th anniversary this year. So, so you're over there, you're married, and business has now... Gone reached, off the cliff. Yeah. Gone off the cliff, and so... Um, you had a father-in-law, and he, he was going to offer you, you you were going to offer him 10% of the business yes. for a loan. What happened? You, so Jack, in, right? Yeah. So in 1990, we sold two buildings, less than $2 million. It was just, things were dead. And um, so we uh, we needed dough, so we went to my... But you were using your credit cards, you told me, too. Well, we were on the credit cards before we went to my father-in-law, yeah. And that when they were tapped out, we went to him, and we said... Um, We'll sell you 10% of the business for $75,000. That was what we... Sounds did. like shock attack. Okay? <laughs> yeah. it, sounds like, it sounds like going to Mark Cuban and saying, hey, come on, you want to buy it? He says, how much business did you do the first year? Yeah, yeah he's a fantastic guy. He said, look, I'm going to lend you the money because I know you're going to pay me back, but um, I'm not taking an interest in your business because you'll end up resenting me. Once He goes, you're going you're gonna to be fine, you're going to recover, but then you'll just resent me for the rest of time for this ownership that I'm not working for. So. so how does the business change? How do you and Bob get out of this this nightmare of the recession and everything else? Well, all recessions end, and we worked hard, and um, little by little. We paid him back, I think, in advance of what we had agreed on with him. So that, that felt great, and we started, uh, started doing better. For the first 10 years or so, we'd hire a salesman every year or so, and the business slowly grew. And then what happens? Another recession? Um, no, I, I think the, the big inflection point was um, we had grown the business to about five million in revenue, really small, and we were, this is 10 years in, so we were making a living, but um, nothing crazy, and we were frustrated. So a national company came into town and, and offered us um, six million dollars for the business, um, and we said, you know, why are you overpaying? And they said, yeah, you're right, we are, but we need to go public, and we have a hole in New York, and um, we actually accepted. And the minute we accepted, it was nothing about them, they were nice people, but we realized we had unfinished business, unfinished dreams, and um, this was May of 2000, the stock market threw up all over itself, and um, they called us back. We were trying to figure out how to unshake their hands, but we're handshake guys, so that was going to be difficult. Um, and they said, deal's off. Multiples change. We're not going public. And we were, we were ecstatic. We were happy. But it was an inflection point that made us really look at how are we going to grow our business? How are we going to 
transform ourselves. And um, it was a great learning experience going through that inflection point. So let's talk about the past 13 years, the goods, the bad, and the indifferent. Mm. That has been the case. We, um, we had a great run from 2000 to 2007. Um, the wind was at our back. Our business did, did very, very well, and we were very, very happy. Um, we went into, um, you, knew the, you knew the world had changed in early 2000 uh, because the, the senior credit market had, had frozen up. Um, so we went, into, um, we went into the latter part of 2007 knowing we had to hunker down. And um, the recession was brutal. 80% of the velocity of building sales um, went away. I think people forget that now, by the way, a little bit. Um, but um, we hunkered through the recession. There were, um, there were some silver linings in there. We planned some new businesses that we're in now. And uh, we had time. We had nothing else to do. So um, it, diversifying uh, felt great. Um, and we, we started some allied business like mortgage brokerage, which has been a really... Retail leasing. Yeah, retail leasing. Started a, uh, a financing fund um, for our, our and our clients' money. And um, so we came out of the recession with a really good plan. Let's talk a little bit about the family. You have a couple of uh, children. Yeah. Um, tell me about their, their names and what they're doing today. Three kids. Um, PJ's 23. He's... Uh, happily working at Avis and Young um, as a leasing specialist. Um, he's one year out of school. And do, you, do you think one day you'd like to see him join the family business as opposed to Grandpa when he sold the business out? <laughs> no, I don't think. I don't, I don't think we'll, uh, we'll have family in the business. Okay, so that's PJ next. PJ. Um, two girls, 21 and 17. 21-year-old uh, is Sarah. She's finishing up at uh, Denison University in Columbus, Ohio. Um, she's loved it there, very happy. She had a fashion internship in the city this summer that, um, at a great company that she really hopes that she can go back to um, when she graduates. And we have uh, Greta, who's uh, 17 years old, uh, senior at Mamaroneck High, and um, our, our athletic star. She's the captain of the uh, field hockey team and captain of the LAX team. And you know, so over the years, it's, it's wonderful that you're celebrating your 25th anniversary this year. Uh, y you and uh, Bob have truly built a, a, a brand, a business, a, a name. I think part of it is also the fact that you guys are involved with the community. You're also on the board of Brookfield, uh, which is a great company. You're on the board of a, another re a retail REIT. And I think that uh, the kid who uh, had a little temporary time at Colgate, really turned it around, and I'm happy that uh, you were here today. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Mike.